Let's uh, kick it off. Uh, would you like to share some information about your background and how elementary got started? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm Mayan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Elementary Data. Uh, we're building an open source data observability solution for data analytics engineers. Um, I started elementary with or my co-founder uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we released our open source last March. Um, and we've both been working with data for many years, I experienced the problems of basically data breaks all the time. And you, you always uh, learn about it way too late after it becomes a real fiasco with your users or consumers. Um, so that's, that was like the problem we wanted to solve in the world. We felt that like there's a need for a solution and we both build a pretty similar solution in different companies. So it felt like there's a place to build uh, a one solution that many companies could use. Um, and I can share why we decided to go open source. I yeah, that would be my next question. So please, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a natural question for this <laughs> podcast and obviously something everyone asks. Um, so what we felt is that uh, when, when we were in these shoes of like engineers trying to solve this problem, uh, there was a, a, a lot of hustle around trying to find a product or a solution, we didn't even think about it because you you need so much to go through so much processes of security and compliance and stuff if you want to give an external tool access to your data. Uh, so it felt like the natural thing people would do was either what we did to build on our own or to look for something they can adopt without going through these processes. Um, so when we thought about people like us and what would be their natural choice, we thought open source is a, is a good choice uh, in that case. And we had the conviction, and I think we still have the conviction that by providing value, we could get them later on to actually go and do the procurement process for a better product or a SaaS product after we actually prove value and like uh, get them to like the product and everything. Absolutely. I'm confident in this approach. And uh, back to the very early days uh, in terms of, uh, you know, launching the product, having some first conversations, how yeah. did that look like? Yeah, so um, I think at first we we did like the uh, textbook, how to do ideation for a startup then discovery phase. And we went and just talked to tons of teams. Um, I think we had conversations with uh, data professionals from 70 different companies and we, we we were like yeah and we were thinking of building an open source solution for you and they were like oh, okay I, I need a solution I don't actually care whether it's gonna be I just need a solution and I think uh, one of the first lessons we learned is when you want to do an open source solution the best approach is just to do an MVP and release it and see if it makes sense and actually people come and use it. And then we learned way more from our first open source users than from all the conversations we had before. So uh, that's that's how we started really early. No, that makes sense. And today, in terms of the ongoing conversations, the organizations you're serving, and the next mm -hmm. step, would you like to highlight um, some activity? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, today we have... Uh, really active Slack community of uh, a bit over 800 users uh, that joined over time from um, many different companies. Um, and they're using elementary, giving us feedback. We're very uh, like attentive to when someone talks about a specific use case or asks about something special. And we always offer to hop on a call and, and learn more. And we learned a lot from our users about how to make the product. Uh, really fit their needs. Um, we even, uh, like just a few weeks ago, we, re we released a dashboard, which we didn't have before. And it was like 95% based on dashboards that we saw users building on the data that elementary creates for them on their environment. That's so cool. like, this is how deep you, you can get uh, product feedback from your open source users. <laughs> and uh, in terms of uh, next 
milestone that we have uh, set is is there something here yeah 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 um so our big challenge for 2023 is to um manage both the closed SaaS beta we started with our first customers and like not hurting our growth in the open source because we feel like we have a long way to go still but as we are trying to build a sustainable business then we have to start uh the the second path as well so we hired uh we we grew the team so we think we can uh, now have the resources to do both and we're still hiring so uh yeah. if you're uh especially front-end developers <laughs> uh we're uh, we're hiring but um i think that's our our biggest challenge for this year to be able to do both um and right now on the open source we're mainly focusing on improving the detection capabilities of the product and making the anomaly detection much better like uh making the the detection more sophisticated and handle use cases like seasonality and stuff so that's like uh the focus there for the next few months at least Lovely. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. And uh, that that would have actually been my next question because uh, indeed the stage you're at is is challenging, and usually some additional resources can help navigate yeah. it. And you make this decision. Uh, could you share something here related topic in terms of monetization and how the team approaches? How can we price that? How can we generate revenue? Um, what do you yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so I think our approach to it was. Uh, we we didn't have an initial plan on like this is where we will draw the line between the open source and the SaaS or anything. We we were just in an approach of let's build an open source project that people would get value of and love. And with time, we will learn about their additional needs. And some of those needs it would make sense to charge money for because it's not their personal need as engineers it's more of an organizational need or it's a need of like bigger companies that have the resources uh to to pay for a product and would prefer to pay for a product and not like invest the devops and everything related to hosting an open source service so that was our initial approach and that actually happened like we we went on conversations with companies and they were like oh, well, we really want you to add a BI integration. We really want you to uh, add interactivity. We really want like specific features and capabilities. And we're like, yeah, that won't work in the open source architecture, but it would work if we had a server or a SaaS like cloud service that could have uh, like interaction and an API and everything. And they're like, okay, cool. So when are you starting your SaaS, like when, where, where can we sign? So uh, it was literally like that, uh, the discovery process. And I think um, we are now on the verge of understanding exactly what's our offering and our positioning. And that's what we're working on with the customers on this closed beta right now. That's great. That's great. Thanks for sharing. And I usually try to, you know, dig a little deeper on this one because for, for most yeah. people, it's uh, the first time they do it to have these yeah. conversations and eventually ask for, you know, a commitment or or, or price yeah, yeah. the product. <laughs> and so for your team uh, trying to, to distill a nugget of advice here, is um, is it in your mind when you're having these conversations and, you know, a big enterprise might say, we need this, this, this. Is it in your mind then to think about how that might translate to a plan? Or do you say, do you just jump in, we'll build it and we figure it out later, let's just make them happy. Uh, how did you navigate this? Uh, if my question yeah, so um, I think everything that was super um, natural and easy in the architecture of the open source, because our open source right now doesn't have a server. So there is a really clear limit. It, it, technologically wise of like what you can implement without a server and what you can. And um, so it was really natural for us to tell like, okay, these features we can't implement in the open source and these features we uh, can only implement in SaaS. And then only later we started realizing that basically the open source really answers the need of the individual and even the data team. But then if they want to get other people in the organization involved, uh, people like the analysts or their consumers or their managers or like things like that. Um, it's more complicated. Like it takes a lot of effort from the, for them. 
And then like when it becomes more of an organization thing, then there is more buying and more power also to, to actually convert and dedicate budget to it. So like things just started to make sense. And I, I actually like that because I think if we would try to plan it ahead, we wouldn't have done a, a good job. Like things just naturally, when things fit, like, you know, sometimes even when you code, sometimes things just, okay, this is how it should work. Like this is, everything fits and you know, you did the right design. So I think that's uh, that's what we feel now about the, where we drew the line sort of. I think that's a helpful answer. <laughs> that's cool. And, to, yeah. and today, uh, what's your day-to-day -day looking like? You know, the activities you do. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Mine as a CEO or like the team? Uh, broadly, you know, and, and also maybe hear how you handle and manage yourself if there's something to share there, maybe something that works for you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, right now my focus as a CEO, we, we've we seen, uh, uh, like we have really nice organic growth to the project. So um, I, I used to invest a bit in, in growth and like in, in getting uh, people more familiar with elementary, but right now, like we feel that we're okay there and I'm, I'm more focused on having conversations with users, uh, both about how we can improve the open source and both about the SaaS beta. And that's a lot of my focus. And that's like 50% and then 50% hiring because that's something <laughs> you always do as a CEO. Um, yeah, and right now the team, uh, we have... Uh, four engineers and we have a product manager um, and they're like building uh, all day the product together. And uh, I'm like a bit jealous because I used to be in the code and in the details and, and I miss that. But I'm also happy that it's like taking a life of its own. And sometimes I'm like talking to users on support and they're asking about a feature and I'm like, oh, we have that feature now. So cool. I didn't know. <laughs> That so that's exciting yeah i like that sentiment and you know that's where a team of co-founders also helps yeah. and growing yeah. the team and uh, on the on the topic of uh, hiring i'm curious um being an open source uh, company solution and having a superpower there have you guys utilized that uh, as a as a ramp towards hiring is it that some of the hires were previously contributors uh if you could just tell us a little bit about this yeah yeah um so i'm um, um actually no like that uh, we didn't hire any uh, contributors um i do think that the being open source was uh, attractive and the people that decided to join elementary found that as a as a big uh like plus plus point for them and they wanted to be part of it um but we just started with hiring from our network mm -hmm. because it was just the, the easiest thing to do um, and like naturally people from our network brought other people from their network. And like, that's, that was the route for hiring. And, um, we were, we were kind of like, didn't decide if we're remote or we're local and we're like, yeah, let's just start hiring. And if we'll have opportunities remote, we'll hire. And if we'll have opportunities locally, we will. Um, and eventually what happened is that everyone we hired are here in Israel. Um, and not necessarily in the office, like some of them are here, but remote. So we are thinking that we can be remote and we should like expand that, but it just like didn't happen yet. And I think now maybe it's, someone needs to be the hero and be our first like offshore hire, and then we'll be able to, to expand the team remotely as well. I'm curious to ask you about the ecosystem uh, developing there. Uh, one quick note before that, uh, just you are actively hiring. Just curious as another founder too, in terms of your hiring process and, and the interviews even, like, do you ask people to actually maybe pick up an issue when, as an interview or is there something else that you guys do that you might like to share? Yeah, so um, we don't do that uh, because we feel like there's something that might feel like uh, you're exploiting uh, the candidate in a way or something but uh, we do let them work on an issue we already worked on like something we already implemented they yeah. need to re-implement it um, of course without access to the repo where it's actually live already because we do want to simulate like something that would be as close as possible to the actual work 
Um, and I think one of the, our best hiring stories was a candidate that we wanted to hire. And while he was interviewing for us, he just started to pick up issues and like <laughs> contribute. And then we were like, oh, we feel bad. We should start paying him for all the work <laughs> he's doing for us. So like, that's, uh, that's how we hired one of our first engineers. So um, <laughs> yeah, if, if you want to join elementary, so that's a, that's a, a good way in. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, th I think people are, are hearing too. So yeah, like what's the scene like in, in Israel? Is there any anything you might like to share about it? Uh... And are you active there in terms of conferences or you know going to offices of other startups and and all this? What's yeah. happening? Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know how if people are familiar with it, but like Israel has a huge tech ecosystem, and uh, there are some companies here that build products that are really popular worldwide, and people probably don't even know they're Israelis, like. Uh, weeks and monday.com and ways and uh, like a lot of tech here um, a lot of the industry here is cyber security related like a lot of big cyber security companies and also small ones um, and not a lot of open source startups like when or and i decided we were gonna do it people thought we were crazy. <laughs> so uh, that, that's one of the reasons, by the way, we, we applied to Y Combinator because we felt like there is a, a knowledge gap that we need to, to fill somehow. And we were like, we, we need to go learn from the best. So we, we, went, we went, like we applied because we saw that other open source companies started it. And, um, but now there are more uh, open source companies here and also, our, our lead investor, one of the reasons we, we decided to uh, fundraise from them is because they invested in some other open source companies here. So they, they're like real believers. Um, and, and they didn't, like we felt that some other investors in the local industry were like, yeah, maybe we'll invest despite the fact that you're open source. And we wanted investors that would invest because we were open source, like that they really believe in it um so it's it's kind of a growing industry and we try to like talk with each other and consult with each other and i felt a lot of support from other founders here that were like in more advanced stages when when i was just starting and i'm trying to help as well like i i think i already talked to like maybe 12 teams that are thinking of doing this go to market and are trying to understand why we did it and what are the challenges and it looks super magical, right, from the outside. It, it really does. Yeah. Uh, when it works, it looks good. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm happy to see all this from uh, a little bit of a distance from, from here in Greece. Uh, we're not too far away, but uh, yeah, I mean, congratulations and, and bravo for, you know, leading the way and also helping the, the people starting starting today. Or, and on that note, is there, um, is there something that uh, maybe, maybe an early, a mistake that, uh, you know, you wish you... Could have avoided or maybe something that you did that worked and surprised you and maybe someone else can hear about it yeah, yeah i think something um a mistake we did i mentioned that earlier um when you want to understand like when you when you think the way to go is open source yeah and it, it, there's a really low barrier of entry right you can just start you can just do something build an MVP, post it, and then you will get immediate feedback on whether it makes sense to users or not, right? Because you post something and then it's it's easy enough to just put a post on Reddit or on LinkedIn or somewhere. And, and if you don't get any traction, it means something. And if you get some initial traction and people, even, even if it sucks, right? Even if it doesn't work, if someone was interested enough to come and tell you it doesn't work, then it means there is something there. And I think we, we realized that, um, like we could have realized that six months earlier, just start building instead of talking and talking and talking and more conversations and more talks. And um, also I think something we did is we were looking for uh, what you would call design partners because that's like the uh, sort of the playbook yes. when you build uh, yeah, a B2B SaaS product look for design partners and again we were going to companies and trying to like make them use 
the open source instead of uh, promoting it and waiting for people to come to us. And then when people came to us, they were actively looking for a solution to this problem in this moment. And like they became like 10 times more engaged and people we were like, please hop on another call with us. <laughs> please try the new version. Yeah. Um resonate with that that's uh th thanks for sharing that and, and yeah this design partnership i saw i understood it as a best practice seeing how the funders do it maybe uh you know us getting a, an offer to be uh, to work with someone like that and uh yeah it, it, it didn't strike to me as as uh it didn't feel I don't, I don't know how to describe it but i i think i subscribe to how you're approaching it um uh, so thanks for sharing this piece of advice i think can apply to a lot of people uh how did you meet with your co-founder with our um Ah. <laughs> um, so uh, I was working on a startup called Signia. I was one of the first employees. Um, and then we grew. And two years later, we hired an engineer, uh, Ronnie, a really talented developer. And we became friends. And then I met her, her husband, Ol. And we became friends as well. And eventually, <laughs> uh, we started ruin ruining a lot of double dates right uh, oh and i talking about uh tech and startups and our ambitions and data and uh eventually we we decided to start a company together <laughs> that's that's so funny that's great and you were already in israel when that happened yeah when, like, the money. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, we're uh, we have a really similar background uh but we like we were in the Israeli army in the same unit at the same years. And then we worked at companies that were really close and a lot of people knew each other. And like, we have a lot of mutual friends, but like we haven't met until that moment when I became friends with his wife. So uh, it's like, a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, Israel is a small country. And like the tech scene here is, it's big in terms of the amount of people that are in tech, but like, it's not that big. Like you still know a lot of people, and um, also a lot of people have the same army background mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, of doing tech in the army. So uh, that's uh, it, like everyone knows everyone. <laughs> that's pretty bad, uh, yeah. I have to say. Uh, and uh, would you recommend someone to consider, um, you know, joining the scene? Is there something maybe they should keep in mind that might be different from what they're used to elsewhere? Um, mm. Um, that's interesting. I think in a way, um, it's really convenient to start a startup here because it's relatively, uh, uh, it's a, it's a relatively experienced ecosystem, like, uh, and there are tons of VCs here all focused on seed stage because everyone raises their seed round from a local fund and then go and do the, the later rounds from US VCs. So like uh, there, there are a lot of opportunities here, um, especially if you wanna do cybersecurity. Uh, if you wanna do anything else, then you need to like convince everyone that it's still a good idea. Like we, we had meetings with investors and they're like, oh, you're not doing cybersecurity? Wait, why are we talking? <laughs> so that's... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, that's a, I think it's also because of our background, uh, which has a lot of cybersecurity in it. So it felt natural to them. Um, but then I think what you should consider in Israel is that it's really competitive in terms of talent because there are so many startups here. Um, so no. that's, uh, that's basically it. Um, yeah, in terms of... Your do you get to travel recently at all? Have you been to the States? Um, um, I didn't travel since we, like for work, since we started elementary. Uh, on my previous job, I used to do like 300,000 miles a year. Uh, <laughs> but it was a, a different type of uh, role because like with open source, everything is so, like people are so used to uh, be online. And I think also with COVID, people got super used to, working remotely with each other. So I didn't feel the need yet. Um, maybe I will next year for conventions and conferences and stuff. Um, I, I do think that something challenging about being a startup in Israel is the time zone differences. Mm -hmm. uh, you find yourself working uh, like all the time because when our day ends, the day in San Francisco starts 
So I, I guess you relate. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, th I think for a lot of programmers too, like we're so used to staying up late in the night when it's quiet, no one can bother you. And and so, you know, at least for us, it's sort of like went with our natural proclivities in the sleeping schedule. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, that people from Europe can can relate to this. Is there today someone in the scene that you sort of like follow or maybe, you know, you can point people to check out or is there another open source project you might like to give a shout out to that you appreciate? Um, um yeah i think um uh, i personally personally i look a lot at the trevers uh they're the creators of lake fs um the ceo uh, her name is Ainat. i think they're doing an amazing job and they're devrel uh, her name is adi polak she's amazing uh, so it's like a, a local example that you can build a really cool and successful open source startup in data from israel so true inspiration for us. Um, and also I, I like uh, Novu. They're building a open source notification system. Uh, I really like their branding and they're, they're like doing really cool stuff everywhere. So uh, they're also local. And uh, I think it's also an example that you can build a lot of traction from here really fast. It's from a representation standpoint. Um... In your local environment there, as a founder broadly, how many peers of yours are women? And uh, I don't know how that uh, how that experience has been for you. Very curious. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess uh, more than you expect, but not as much as I wanted. Mm -hmm. Like uh, in my YC batch, there were 10% women, but hardly any CEOs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think here in Israel, it's, it's like the same, like you do see more and more women in tech, but not in like really leading positions yet. Um, I think uh, like a while back, I saw an article, there are like a hundred unicorns in Israel, but only one women CEO of a, of a unicorn. So uh, it's, she's uh, of uh, Papaya Global. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a... Uh, this is something that bothers me as a woman CEO, right? But uh, on the team, we just uh, made our first hire for a, a woman engineer. So that's cool. And I'm happy it was like our uh, fourth hire, which is pretty, pretty early. Um, and on my previous startup, I was able to build a team of 50-50. So I hope I, uh, I'll, I'll be able to do the same in elementary as well. Is there, a, is there an easy way for people and, and for, uh... You know, female CEOs to reach out to you maybe for for advice. Uh, here's some. Is are your DMs open? Would you like to? Make yeah, it? yeah, my DM is open in Twitter and LinkedIn. I try to to respond. Sometimes it takes me a while. Um, and I'm um, I'm doing uh like we're doing an on call on the elementary Slack. So mm -hmm. when I'm on call, <laughs> I'm super responsive on, on our Slack. So that's also a good way. That's to like reach. the best place. The best place for yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, thanks yeah, for yeah. Ro Ronnie or his wife joined our Slack a while yeah. back because she learned that even if he's not answering his phone, he answers on Slack. <laughs> yeah, the realities of being a founder. Um, for um, in terms of YC and uh, you know, with your batch and other open source uh, companies in it, is is there something uh, more you might like to share here? How it has benefited you all guys? Uh, what it looks like today? Um, this communication, yeah. Yeah, I think we learned a lot, uh, both from the batch itself and working with our partner with, that that was the partner that like worked with really cool companies like Postdoc and Airbyte and like helped them get to where they are and saw them in the early days and what were their struggles. So we learned a lot from it, from Dalton. Um, and also we we we're able to reach out and talk to a lot of these founders and, and learn a lot from them. Um, so that was a really good decision. Um, mostly on, not like on super practical advice on what exactly should we do at each moment, but more on how we should think and how should we make decisions and how we should um, measure whether our decisions were successful or not. And like understand if we failed, how to change fast and like, uh, so this type of, of mindset was really uh, what we got from doing YC. Absolutely. And and these folks, the, their names keep coming up again and again from 
almost every open source founder. So it seems like, you know, just if you reach out to them, whoever is listening, you know, you, you hear back, they, they help a lot. Sounds like so. Yeah, I think that I think they're also super open and sharing. So a lot of us learned a lot from them. Um, I can personally say also that I talked to um, one of the founders of Prefect, mm -hmm. uh, which was a super insightful conversation and I learned a lot from. So um, he gave me a super valuable advice. He told me that they uh, treated their first um, like thousand open source users as paying customers like mentally and i think we really uh try to do the same and like not make them feel like you're using an open source product it's it's free like we don't like they get super um good service and attention from us and i think it really makes them trust us because for them, it doesn't really matter if they if it's a SaaS product and they're paying for it or if it's an open source product, they need to know that they can trust it in production. Uh, so I think we, we were able to build that trust as a team before the product was like really mature. So that's something I think was a, a really good advice early on. That's an important note. Thanks for, thanks for sharing this. And, uh, you know, before I, I run out all the time that you made available, um, two things. One is in terms of building community, if there's uh, any lesson there that you might like to share or, or challenges of it. And then, you know, personally, from your experience, uh, if you could part us with uh, some lessons. Yeah. Um, so I think something that uh, like we did from the very beginning without thinking about it too much, it was just like, an intuition that we should do it, but uh, it really paid off is to uh, be very personal in interactions. And like when someone asks you for something and then like a week later, you come up with a solution, go back and tell them that they made you think of the solution and and um, like thank them for sharing their use case and thank them for, because you are really thankful, right? You're learning a lot from them. They're making you think. Um, they reported a bug, they gave you an advice, they thought of a use case that you didn't, like you need to be super, you need to communicate how impactful they are on the decisions you make, like your community members. And I think that we we were doing that because we just like enjoyed the interaction, like the human interaction with our first users. But um, as we scale, we try to, to um, communicate to the team and the employees how important that is and and it also makes the employees super committed mm -hmm. as they see like the faces and, and they know the people that are waiting for what they're building so I think that's uh, like just understand that it's people to people in a way like we're building something for other people who are pretty similar to us and have challenges and like we're all trying to figure out something together um, and being really authentic about it right like not uh, do things like, um, I don't know, post uh, uh, on LinkedIn or anything, just thank them personally and they're gonna feel great about it. And many times they're gonna do uh, the posting for you because they're gonna be so grateful and, and happy about it. That, uh, and that's the best, like the best kind of publicity anyway, right? So. Absolutely. And, and to reiterate on this, you know, it's not just for the GitHub issues, which are very visible, but it could be a comment in your Discord server, like a reply on a tweet or on a YouTube comment, yeah. like everywhere. You're saying all of those go in, interact, show your appreciation. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, thanks for sharing this. And, and, uh, and back to the founder's note, like, I mean, I have been personally learning so much more doing this, you know, on a regular basis and, and, and speaking with customers than, than any other way in the past of interviewing someone who... Might not, might not even be the right audience for uh, for your audience. Um, you know, how would you characterize maybe today the people that are uh, sort of like you know your solution is the best uh, for their uh, problems? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they're characterized as analytics engineers, um, which are people building pipelines um, using a framework called DBT. Um, mainly doing it in SQL and like we're super integrated into DBT so we're the like the best solution for them and that's a really growing population and we really believe that uh, like since we first started uh, trying out DBT we're like okay this is just the right way to work so 
we were like, let's join that wave and build tools for these people because that's how they're going to work in the future. So uh, teams using DBT extensively uh, and specifically the analytics engineers building the DBT project. Absolutely. I like this. Uh, Another uh, inspiring open source company, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for uh, all these folks to get started today, uh, where do they go? Uh, what, like if you want to become an analyst? Um, to, to start, to get started with the product, but also to become a contributor. <laughs> ah, so uh, just go to our GitHub, our docs, uh, super easy. You just need to import elementary to your DBT project um, and you can start. And if you want to be a contributor, you can just, like we have a, an open for contribution label on GitHub. It's uh, really pink. <laughs> and, and has a lot of hearts in it so you're gonna <laughs> it, it, it stands out so you can find it easily and and a lot of the contributions are not from those issues these are the contributions are a lot of times issues that we didn't think about and users just found or came up with and suggested and uh, we try to respond extremely fast to everything and if you're interested in joining the team also check out uh yeah, we have. Uh, you can just go to our website. Uh, it's really there's a banner. Join us <laughs> on the top, uh, and uh, feel free to DM me uh, in any platform. Uh, if you are scared that you can't pronounce my name, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm used to it, and then it's fine. You can call me Maya, or uh, I'll respond. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to interview. I really appreciate your time and. Very last thing, because some might be, some people uh, might be interested. You told me that uh, some of your background is from Argentina, and uh, you're a football fan, a soccer fan, and Argentina won the World Cup. How did that make you feel? You? Uh, <laughs> happiest I've ever been in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Qatar also, hmm. uh, not for the final, for the quarterfinals, but it was uh, exciting and amazing, uh, and. Uh, like a really good experience after Russia, which wasn't that amazing for us. Um, and you went, you went I, there I even too. got wow. a tattoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I even got a tattoo with my dad, <laughs> for <laughs> a, which we were planning to do since 2014, but then we didn't win. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's how excited I was. <laughs> <laughs> I am excited now too. Wow. Thanks for sharing this. This is phenomenal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, Mayan, thanks so much once again. And I'm looking forward to hopefully even repeating this after, uh, you know. Yeah. Some time. And uh, yeah. if we find ourselves uh, in Israel or if you find yourself in Greece, of course, uh, you know, it would be great. Yeah, to depending on our uh, Champions League draw next year. <laughs> right, maybe a soccer game over what uh, <laughs> over again. Um, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to meet you. <laughs> Bye.